Steve, are you are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Carol. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. I'm really I'm a bit tired because I <laughs> suffer from a bit uh, from uh, some sleep deprivation this morning thanks to my uh, nine months old son. But uh, I'm okay. <laughs> I, I, I know the feeling. I've got a ten month old little boy as well. <laughs> you have my sympathy. You guys um, are heroes. <laughs> yeah, and thanks for the talk, John. That was really today, good. Today, maybe if tomorrow. I'm... Tomorrow we'll see. <laughs> we'll yeah. see. So uh, I give you the. Um, I just want to say one thing about you, Steve. Uh, you are uh, the reason why this webinar has been has been done, because I was very inspired by your effort, and uh, I thought it was a, a great experience in in sharing between people from every part of the world and uh, today we have uh, another representation of this so uh, i'm honored to have you uh, speaking with us and please grazie carlo thank you very much and thank you for the invite as well and um, again it, i think there's been some of the speakers on here that spoke at um the event that we did and yeah it's just during these difficult times it's nice to try and bring everyone together so hopefully this just helps you forget what's going on outside for a little bit. So, um, Carlo, can you see my screen okay, just to check before I get going? Yes, perfectly. Cool. Thank you very much. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. And I'll I'll talk a little bit slower than what I not normally do, so hopefully you can understand it. So it's an interesting place in England that I am from, and the accent is sometimes a bit strong. So hopefully whoever is translating this for you, whether it be yourself or anyone else, I hope that this is um, easy enough for you to understand. Now, basically the, what I wanted to discuss and a lot of the reasons why, like, again, the webinar that Carlo mentioned before came about was I have a conversation with a lot of people about talking about the journey that we've been on and where we're actually going as a discipline because we look at sports science S&C and we go, right, what are we doing different? compared to where we started and what are the questions we're actually trying to answer as part of this as well um and i think it's really interesting because someone somewhere originally started off with a blank canvas there was no research there was no information someone somewhere went this is what i'm going to do to try and help these athletes this is what i'm going to do in order to monitor how they're improving and it all starts with that question because ultimately we have to start from the very beginning to then work our way forward. And we constantly have to ask ourselves the question along the way. And I'm very fond of trying to run a needs analysis with whatever environment um, that I'm in. And it's constantly asking that question, what are we trying to do? And while I, I believe in an athlete-centered approach which is one of the best ways to get a higher level of performance, Sometimes we need to think about the needs analysis of a coach or a medical staff or of a sports scientist or an S&C coach or a video analyst in order to get the very best out of them. So from a structural point of view, it's a lot of psychology making sure that we can get the best out of those individuals to help support our programs. And again, a lot of the experiences that I've seen over like the last 14 years that I've been in the elite sporting environment have come from mistakes being made and different personalities bringing together those unique stories of one there's been ups and downs whether it be relegations or promotions and championship winning seasons there's a lot to take into account and that all comes about through making sure that actually what we are doing is as optimal as possible for that environment now that environment changes depending on the head coach and the support staff and the players working within it. And if you've been at a club for a long time, you'll probably see the evolution or regression of some squads, of some players and staff, depending on where you're at. And it's interesting to see how this kind of needs analysis. While there's a basic element to football is what I'll focus purely on, but even throughout sports, there's still the basic element of you need to beat the opposition, you either score more goals or you're in a competition with them like athletes as in the Olympics you have to beat your opponent and those are the basic things that we need to remember when always trying to do this and this is this is the 
thing where working with both men and women in the past, there's, there's definitely a tendency to have to think about the population you work with. And that, like I mentioned, the individual, but then we start talking about the sex of the athlete that we're working with, the age of the athlete that we're working with, and all those different models start to come into it. And engaging with the athlete now, depending on their age, we're going to engage with them in a different way. Depending on their mood swings and their attitudes, you can have the same athlete, and I had a few of these, whereby one day they come in and they're the happiest person in the world. The next day, they're angry, they're moody. You can't get any f- communication done. So it's part of that athlete sense approach to actually, this is what we feel is going to benefit you. This is what's going to help performance. If we feel it's that strong, you're doing this, we tell you. But sometimes you have to make sure you work with that athlete because they might not respond accordingly. And when we think about the athlete and actually what we're trying to achieve, and Aaron did a great talk on this this morning as well, and I'm conscious that two of the authors of this editorial are, were actually presenting earlier on today, which was great to, to listen in. And looking at that kind of dose-response relationship is ultimately what we're trying to achieve. We want to be able to give the athletes something that makes them better, and that might have different implications for that. So whether or not that be we're trying to improve training, we're trying to improve their strength in the gym. We're trying to have a hypertrophy program. John spoke about all the potential different exercises that could be used to really promote different qualities of the SNC aspects of the side of the athlete. And when we bring it back to performance monitoring, actually, there's a phrase in England that we use which is called horses courses, which basically means that you select the right thing for the right thing which as simple as that sounds, is sometimes maybe miscommunicated, especially when like football, whereby because it's a multidisciplinary activity with loads of change of directions, I think over 1,300, we start to see these trends and patterns whereby actually, one, are we training appropriately? Two, are we getting the outcomes that we want? So looking at organization and the quality and quantity of the exercise. And there's been a big shift towards external load. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail. But we always got to remember that internal load. And again, like I'll brush on this very briefly because Aaron did a lot of great, um, like he presented a lot of great slides about this and great information. And actually from an internal point of view, are we getting the adaptation that we need in order to really promote that improvement in performance? And if it's not, we review and assess it and so on. And we turn back to, what are we monitoring? Is it the right thing to be monitoring for that event? And again, we've seen over the course of uh, years gone by, there's been an evolution within how we're monitoring this kind of training dose response has changed as well in the bowl. And this kind of infographic highlights a really good paper that basically showed about the physiological and biomechanical evidence. Because we have different external and internal load measures in both those fields as well one's not just the heart for example so internal load has normally been associated with like your subjective measures like rpe and heart rate response and so on but actually there's internal load measures to do with the biomechanics of the body as well so like joint load muscle load and so on and actually using differential rpe to look at the leg zone so we need to be aware of like the intricacies with that and i think this was a really good paper to highlight that and where we can actually start to go a little bit deeper into those questions if this is kind of examining a a car for example we have like the engine we have the servicing we have like how the tires are performing we need to be able to look at each individual thing at the right time in order to really get the best out of our athletes and i think this is just one side that i like to bring to because we've got access to loads of different tools and my my job now is obviously like to do with um members devices and those inertial measurement units even when even when working as a practitioner and consulting with some of these clubs, like we have to remember what we're monitoring for. You might have all the solution, solutions underneath your umbrella because you've got an unlimited budget, but sometimes they don't get used as much. Yet, if you so, my first job, I worked um, a League One team that got promoted to the championship, and we were a very small club and had no budget. So, we had to ask the right performance questions. We there was no GPS was just in its infancy. So again, which is showing my age a bit. And 
we had to make sure that we were getting the information that was appropriate, one for the coach staff and for the players, but also to provide us with the information to say they were improving. And I think one thing that I like I like to kind of point out to people is don't be that sheep. So very famous character from some English films, Sean the Sheep. We want to make sure that we're not having a generation of people that just follow exactly the same as every other practitioner. We are taught at universities and institutions to have critical minds and be really critically analysing of the data that were presented because ultimately, one, is it valid and reliable? Two, are we using it for the right reasons? And three, can we actually use it to implement it and improve performance or reduce the risk of injury? And you'll probably hit, you won't hear me say uh, prevent injury. Just part of my philosophy is I don't think we can prevent injury. We can reduce the risk by doing some of the exercises that like Johan showed and what John was showing with the gym work. But we're, all, we're trying to improve performance. Now, how we define performance might be sport specific. It might be someone within that sport has a different definition of performance to what you have because of what their objectives are. As a sports scientist or an SNC coach, our objective might be we have a good performance if we have every player performing as well as what they can on the pitch. We might get some injuries, but that's our performance if we're getting them to optimal performance. Or you might have the other side of it whereby, actually from an injury point of view, our performance is we need to make sure they're all on the pitch. It doesn't matter how they're performing, but making sure they're on the pitch. I know which side of that balancing board I stick with, and I know what tools that I use, but we have to ask that question. And ultimately, like differential RPE, which is in the middle for me, has been a really valuable tool. And by the time I left Hull City, we had um, we had catapult, we had playmaker, we had polar heart rate belts, and we had differential RPE to monitor our external training loads, along with some other measures. So this is purely from a field-based point of view at the minute. Like there's obviously a different side to gym aspects, which other people are present about. But I'm just going to focus on kind of this whole external training load. And it was interesting. I did a I did a review, very brief review of the literature. And it's interesting. You can probably see where this technology started to creep into our discipline. And there's been near enough close to an exponential curve within the amount of research that we've had. Now, whether that's because sports science as a discipline was quite new, it might actually be because increase in technology has made it a lot easier to publish in this area. And during my my PhD, I remember looking for, um, when I started, it was to do with payload from catapult devices. Um, so accelerometry data, because that's one of my passions now. And there was literally no research papers in elite sport at that time investigating accelerometry data. So it was a relatively new concept, yet we now have like thousands and thousands worth of information using it. And... Actually, are we using it appropriately? Are we using it in the way that it was designed to? So accelerometers, for example, were talked about with indirect links to energy expenditure, use of gate analysis, which I'll come on to, and actually just physical activity in general. So we all have accelerometers with our smartphones. They count the number of steps that we're taking per day. And they're really smart for the general population just to provide them targets along the way. So within elite sport, What's actually our aims and objectives to use accelerometers in there? And actually, can we use it as part of like this dose-response relationship? We've seen benefits of increasing like fitness training loads through things like RPE and different measures of heart rate responses. So, for example, like an improvement in um, the velocity at lactate threshold. We can see that presented by the table up here. And likewise, this paper by Clement and colleagues as well shows just how the fluctuation of a dose-response relationship can affect different parts of fitness variables in professional soccer players. And I'll have, like the slides I'll happily share so we can go into that. I'm just conscious of time to make sure that we can catch up. Um, and I think the thing as well, going from this, we think about the dose-response relationship, but what can actually alter our interpretation, that information? And we've seen within a couple of studies that we've run using linear mixed modeling, um, that we can actually start to see what is actually causing this fluctuation within our data. So for example, like if I look at the top one, focusing on uh, the differential RPE within 
match play. What we actually found was it wasn't just playing position that had jobs. Yes, in the formation that we were playing, so when we were in the Premier League at Hull, which this paper was from, we predominantly played a 4-4-2 formation, sometimes 3-5-2. And the full-backs were always expected to overlap and run, so their high-speed running and sprint output tended to be a lot higher, as well as the high-intensity action, so accelerations and decelerations as well. Now, however, if you have a very fit fullback that was able to cope with those demands, would they actually rate it as high? And so these scales out of 120, as an example, they're actually showing us the fluctuation. Now, there isn't that much. So is playing position the way forward? I mentioned the individual before, so we have to consider that. But also looking at the match result, which had no implication on the differential RPE, match location, didn't have any influence on the differential RP from an internal level perspective. But it was interesting to actually look at the leg soreness and the actual technical stroke, tactical kind of um, implications of playing different standards of plays. And it was new information to us because what we'd, we kind of knew it was happening and the players had always reported it, but we didn't have an objective way to measure it. And technically this is still subjective, but the players were still rating how they found it. And it was interesting just to see that whenever they played against the top teams, and this might have been because of multiple reasons, but they always found it tougher from a mental point of view, playing against the top teams, even though there was no um, no significant differences anyway um, with regards to looking at the top teams as well. And we break that down even further and we say, well, actually there's, so looking at play load and the accelerometry data, we can actually see this big variability caused by game to game, the individual player and the position. So actually it was interesting. So play load within this study, which included three uh, different under 23 teams around the UK uh, across two seasons where for match play data, the biggest thing that explained play load was the individual and it was like close to 64%. So while we start talking about um, the possibilities of, different training load measures to account for the dose-response relationship, we need to consider actually what is going to affect our interpretation of that data. And potentially looking at this, is it better to do it on an individual level? And this might just be accelerometry data because is that more sensitive than what we're measuring elsewhere? I don't know. It's a question. And that's where really the direction that I think our discipline is going in with regards to external training load only, because I think there's still a need for that internal load measure, as I mentioned. And I really enjoyed this editorial done by um, the local John Moore's group and the Lumen group with um, Jos. And this was quite insightful, really, to just put another slant on it. So as a discipline, we have been used since the introduce, introduction of GPS technology, we've been used to total distance covered, high-speed run sprints, accelerations, decelerations, metabolic power derived from GPS-based metrics, okay? And now, when we think about it, actually, is that what we want to get from an output point of view, or are we simply getting that because it was available to us, other people have done it, and would that cheap? When we start to ask the questions, what really is going to impact our performance? What's going to start to look at helping us to reduce the risk of injury? And I go back and do a bit of a literature, literature search. And ultimately, one of the, throughout any sport, most sports anyway, I'm sure some, some people will challenge that in the, in the audience. By all means, feel free to do so because I'm not the smartest guy here. Like running is a key aspect to most team sports. And how efficient we are with those running, running cycles can sometimes affect us. Now, it doesn't mean that we ought to be upright getting the exact same running patterns as an elite. Olympic athlete, but we have to be efficient within our running, within our own gait cycle. You look at some of the best rugby players and football players, so soccer players in the world, their running mechanics are nowhere near what you would call efficient, but it works for them. And it's ultimately a change in those individual mechanics that can start to affect them. What um, the small and colleagues paper showed with the fatigue, sprint, and hamstring injury risk was actually there was a change in kind of like stride length metrics and looking at the hip flexion angles and hip extension. And it kind of got me got me thinking, like, how do we actually take that into the field? Is it possible? And this is where, looking back at my literature review with accelerometers, 
that's accelerometers have been used for gait analysis. So can we actually start to investigate this within a an applied field for football? So again, this is a bit of unpublished research done. So to give a brief background on it, we basically uh, ran with two accelerometers uh, and gyroscopes, so IMU devices, one each foot, so the player make devices, and one between the shoulder blades um, to mimic where a normal GPS device would be placed. And so on these graphs here, the orange line, which is here, is that's the one between the shoulder blades. Green line is the left foot, and the blue line is the right foot. So the potential information that we're missing through the different location of the accelerometer is potentially massive to what we really want to know in order to identify these kind of running analysis. Now, this is actually how we were looking to try and develop um, gate analysis through accelerometers, so being able to see contact time, flight time, step length, and so on, so that we can start to assess the symmetries and just provide more information to kind of like these early bits of research to then progress it to actually, can we take the lab to the field? So again, it was funny, this editorial came out halfway through this project, so it was quite a nice link to see this. And this is just a case study. So fortunately, I've been able to work with a couple of athletes remotely and use these um, IMUs to basically pick out what they've been doing. So this athlete did two, set, uh, two minutes on, one minute off for six sets. The red line is his total distance covered, so again, typical measure of what we would see within a GPS device and that time motion data that we've been used to. And what we can see from the response aspect of his mechanics, like going back to the models earlier, is actually a shift in the, so this blue line here is the contact duration symmetry. So if it was a positive number, it would be a left bias. If it was a negative number, it would be a right bias. And so what we see is actually a shift in this player's mechanics when in theory fatigue is potentially kicking in. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have any internal measure for this because the player forgot his heart rate belt. Um, but what we're starting to see is actually this change in how someone can shift. Now, again, when we think about prescription of exercises, should we have stopped this player at set four? Should we have actually said, is this an appropriate exercise for this player to be doing? And this is where we have to learn and providing us there's a lot of information out there. And that's why I'm saying it's picking the right me measures in order to get the right answers that we desire. And I'm conscious of time, so I'll go through the next bit quickly. But West, we're talking about football, whereby kicking is one of the main aspects that we probably haven't started to um, investigate too much within the literature. So at Hull, for example, just before I left, we were starting to investigate left and right foot maximal release velocity or kicking velocity. So what you can see here is like this was a profile of um, all the goalkeepers at the club with the names taken off. And we were looking at the left leg versus right leg. And it was funny because, what, and again, this is anecdotal and it's part of future research moving forward that we need to investigate, is actually we were presented with some of these things. Now, you would think everyone's got a dominant and non-dominant foot, so there would be natural differences. We actually found that players who were dominant in one side but actually had good mechanics were able to still release the ball just as quick off both sides you can see that a couple of times there and this number up here presents the level of symmetry between their kicking actions and from an anecdotal point of view there are at least three out of these five players who have all had previous injury history related to the lower limbs which if we were to ask the right question this is why we were monitoring the release velocity of them and again, just to show practice what I preach, um, one of the master students that we had at Hull, that I'm still supervising for the University of Hull, uh, has been looking into the validity and reliability of these measures. Because the new measures, we always test this first to make sure that we're getting the right outcomes as well. And I'll briefly go into this, but a potential other avenue with football is technical actions. And using uh, biobanding, technology and looking at different passing networks we've actually found that when we do 4v4 games with early and late maturity so again as i mentioned earlier in the presentation those different types of personalities those different type of players the effects on them in different ways can be massive and looking at session rpe 
And even relating that to actually how hard did they find it? Well, actually, they found it harder, and yet they had less time on the ball. So was that an appropriate session to help them develop from a technical point of view? So we look at Team A on here, which were the uh, they were the late maturing players, and actually there's hardly any pass interactions yet with Team B. We can see within a five minute block, most of the players have all passed to each other, other than uh, player twelve just only like to pass to play nine. So these are all like kind of practical now um, implications for where we're taking this technical and tactical data as part of our monitoring. Because ultimately, and again, going back to the very first slide, how can we help communicate with coaches? How are we able to look at the dose-response relationship to improve our performance and reduce risk of injury? We have always been looking purely at the physical. Like from a GPS point of view, heart rate point of view, we're focused on the physical aspects. There are still some unique actions in our sport that we are still missing. So this is where my research is going at the minute in order to help create that. And again, it's all well and good me putting research up, but this is just an example of kind of the report that we used to do at Hull just to give a brief idea of the technical information that was going to the coach and stuff. And the coach and staff would help design these drills because ultimately not just the drills but also the, the templates because this was for them and you have to provide it to them martin Bashite did a really good paper a few years ago coach here's my report we flip it on its head and say coach here's your report this is your report that you want to look at and we'll help you along the way to discuss it and change it as we go depending on the needs analysis of that current environment those current players and what you require throughout and just to finish, and then conscious I've gone a couple of minutes over, so apologies about that, Carla. But I'd just like to thank all the postgraduate students that are currently work with and all um, co-authors and contributors to research that I've led or been a part of. So, and again, I'll go to the last one because, uh, and I, Carla, you might correct me if I'm wrong with this, but grazie per l'attention. Did I do that right or not? Uh, perfectly right. Grazie per l'attenzione. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so thank you very much and contact you so there if anyone wants to get in touch thank you thank you Steve. thanks very much uh, we have uh, a lot uh, going on with your presentation so many more concepts uh, it was very nice the fact uh, where you were talking about um, biomechanical monitoring which linked with the presentation of uh, JB this morning so a, perf a perfect thing to, to make people think and see other things and try to understand and dig deeper into what they want to, to focus uh, on. Uh, thank you once again, Steve.